the back of the, um, of the sanctuary and also out in the narthex where we, also, we have pieces of paper where you can write these things down. Um, I have a list of all the songs that we sing regularly here at 9 o'clock. Um, and you could look up the words to any of those. Um, and so we're asking for your feedback, for you to share with us the songs that have meant something to you. You can do that through a link that we have put out there online. You can also do it on paper that we have out in the narthex. Um, and what we're going to do is when we get to the end of September, we're actually just going to sing all our favorite songs for a Sunday. We're going to sing all the songs that have shaped our life with God and praise God um, in song entirely. So I hope you will take advantage of doing that. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you for worshiping with us online. I would remind you there's an offering plate at the back. And thank you for wearing your mask if you're in the room. All right. Uh, Wes has, uh, is going to talk to us a little bit before we have our um, first song. Our first song this morning. Oh, hey, by the way, good morning. Um, I uh, am glad to be with you all this morning. Um, I want to thank uh, Tony Ruth for um, uh, handling things very well last week when I was gone, and to the praise team for um, uh, doing a great job last week. Um, it's good to be back. <clears throat> I, um, the first song we're doing this morning is um, uh, one of my favorites uh, that we do. Um, especially like do this on a communion Sunday, it's invitation. And um, kind of the first, uh, with the verses and the chorus, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and it's really based on what Jesus says in Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. And it's about us making room and, uh, in our hearts and our lives for, for God's presence. And, um, <clears throat> and especially as we uh, prepare to come to the table for communion, um, helps us think about what it means to welcome God and to be welcoming to one another. But I love the bridge. It really takes us back to Moses on Mount Sinai when God says, take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground um, that open up our eyes to see you in the ordinary in the last line of the bridge. Everything is burning with the glory of the Lord. So open our eyes to see where God is in the ordinary, not in the over the top of the dramatic or, you know, fire from heaven, but and the ordinary interactions, ordinary things of the day, that's where God's presence is. So um, I love that bridge. And it, it fits in with uh, Methodist theology with what John Wesley uh, really was talking about, taking the good news out of fancy, ornate churches into the ordinary stuff of life and the world. So this song is an invitation for us to open our eyes and see God um, everywhere in everything. So, yeah. Let's stand as we are able.
Amen, my friends. You may be seated. Um, as Wes is coming together, I just want to mention that we have been praying for two folks that are in ICU with COVID in our community, uh, Martin Eford and um, Louis of Louis Grill. Um, both continue to be in the hospital and are um, fighting hard for their lives. So um, please be in prayer for Martin and for Louis and for their families, as well as for all those who are in hospital right now. Um, it's just so important that we take care of one another. Um, I've heard in the last week of, of two different situations where somebody needed a surgery um, that was an emergent situation and they needed to, they had to wait um, in order to get a bed. And um, that's happening, it's real in our community and, um, and it's not people that you don't know, it's people that you are in relationship with. So um, loving and caring for one another, I invite you to, to just be mindful of one another and everything that we do and to continue to look for all the ways that we can share God's love for other people in the way that we care for one another. Um, so just a, a word of encouragement there. Prayer. Thank you, Tony Ruth. <clears throat> Let us go to the Lord together in prayer. Gracious Holy God, we thank you for your presence that is with us all the time, wherever we go. <clears throat> God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. <clears throat> Lord, as we gather this morning, we pray that your spirit would be at work in us as we sing, as we pray, as we hear your word proclaimed. God, whether we are here in person or watching online, we pray that <clears throat> we would be renewed, inspired, and nourished by our worship this morning. God, there are so many things going on in our world, <clears throat> so many struggles, so many uh, crises, so many tragedies, God. It's hard to keep up. And Lord, in the midst of all of that, you call men and women, ordinary people, to reach out, to serve, to help in extraordinary ways. God, we pray that your church would be on the front lines of that, that you would call us to serve, <clears throat> that you would empower us to reach out to help those who are impacted by this pandemic, and that's so many of us, God. Those in our world who are impacted by uh, the hurricane, by Ida, by earthquakes, by fires, God, by any number of disasters. And we pray for those in our community, in our nation, in our world who are impacted by violence, God, those who live in fear, those who struggle with addiction, God, those who are in prison, we pray that you would give us a heart to reach out to folks who feel lost, who feel alone and afraid or worthless. God, help us to, in our words and our actions and our attitudes, to carry your good news to them. Help us never to forget, God, that it was out of your great love for us that you sent your son, Jesus, <clears throat> born not as a king, not as a ruler, but as a vulnerable child to vulnerable parents, humble who lived and taught, reaching out especially to those on the margins, God, and who died for all of us so that we might be forgiven. So help us to remember that all that we have, all of our lives, all that we do, all of it is a gift. It's all grace. And as we remember that, God, help us to be grateful. 
We pray for our community, for our state, our nation, and for the world as we continue to battle this pandemic. For those who are sick in intensive care on ventilators, we pray that you would give them some measure of peace and comfort. We pray the same for their families. We pray that you would help us to be wise in our decisions, to be gracious and compassionate with one another. We pray that you would bless your church, that we might be a beacon of hope and light, goodness, compassion, and empathy in dark times. Bless us and guide us and bind us together by your Holy Spirit. We ask all of this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm going to ask you please stand. Um, <clears throat> We're going to say together, uh, we're going to pray our prayer for illumination together before our reading from the gospel this morning. So join me in prayer, please. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. (laughs) Our text this morning is Luke Um, uh, 23, verses 32 through 47. Hear now the word of the Lord. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching. But the leader scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there, kept deriding him and saying, Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed have been condemned justly, for we are getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. This is the word of God for all people. Thanks be you may be seated. Our second reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Hear now the word of the Lord. What then are we to say? Should we continue sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we will certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever died is freed from sin. 
But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lived, he lives for God. So you too must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God for all people. Thanks be to God. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of every heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week, we started our series talking about theology and song by talking about grace. What marks, in particular, the, the Methodist people separate is the way that we understand the many ways that God's grace or God's unmerited favor is at work in us, in the world around us, and for us. The Wesleyan way of salvation is marked by grace. Last week we talked about provenient grace, God's grace that goes before us. God working oh. His mercy. And now in the depth of our need for God's mercy, we know that we need saving, but we are still without the power to do anything to save ourselves. Our will is still mired in sin's grip and needs release. God is still a holy God and cannot abide sin. And the penalty of sin is still death. Our shortfall is great, and we still need help bridging the gap between us and God. We all still hold guilt, and we still need forgiveness for our rejection of God's love. Evil and sin and death are still real enemies, and we have no power to defeat them. Scripture is clear that into that mire, into that mess... God puts on flesh and walks in to save a people that he created in love. It is always God's initiative to save. It is still God's unmerited favor for us. It is God rolling up God's sleeves and getting to work, not just around us like he would in provenient grace, but for us on our behalf. John Wesley called that justifying grace. Now, to be justified just means to be made right with. The most often way that you would hear that word used, justification, is like if you're working on a paper, if you're typing, and you want everything lined up on one side or the other, they call it left justification or right justification. Justification just means to be lined up with, to be made right with, to be aligned with. Charles Wesley after his conversion, his second conversion, you might call it, wrote a hymn called, And Can It Be That I Should Gain, to celebrate what God had done for him, to celebrate the justifying grace of God. And the first verse, And that I should gain, and a share, for me, who caused his pain for me, Can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? In this hymn, Charles Wesley muses on the what and the why and the how of God accomplishing our salvation. In theological terms, it is called atonement theory. In the story of the crucifixion that we just read, did you catch that little piece where it said that when Jesus died, the, te the temple curtain was torn in two? The temple in the curtain that they're talking about is that the section, um, this curtain that hung between the regular temple and the Holy of Holies, where they believed the presence of God dwelt. And for that curtain to be torn in two means that the thing that was separating us from the presence of God is now gone. 
Atonement, if you think about that word, at one meant, that's what it means. It means to be brought back into relationship with God, to be able to be in the very presence of God. Now, across history and denomination, there are many of these atonement theories that help us understand what God has done for us and why it needed doing and why it required God to be in the flesh and why Jesus had to die, God's own son, on a cross for us. And I'm going to share with you just uh, these four um, and they're not comprehensive, but they are the four sort of primary ones that you will hear at work in the world. And my bet is that you've sort of weighed in on different one of these. You just haven't thought about it that way. You haven't thought about it as atonement theology, but I'm teaching you that it is. Okay? So the first one is called Christus Victor, which means Christ as victor. And this is how it goes. Satan and his power are real. God comes in the flesh, Jesus being fully God and fully human. And he takes on the forces of evil. And they kill him. But Jesus is God. And he cannot die. And so he rises from the grave, conquering the power of evil and sin and death. Now connected to that is the idea that humanity is held captive by sin. That there is a that we're in prison, and that there is a ransom to be paid for our release from captivity, a price. That, and that in Jesus, God pays that ransom and is victorious. In Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about this. He says, who will rescue me from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now certainly, friends, God is almighty and fully present at Jesus, and he is victorious over sin and death. But the problem with this theory is that there's really no focus on why Jesus needed to be human in order to get that done. Why did he need to take on flesh? A second theory called substitutionary or penal substitution or satisfaction theory goes like this. It says, sin is real, and humanity chose sin knowing full well all the way back in the Garden of Eden if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you will surely die. It's right there in the very beginning. And we chose sin knowing that it brought death. And God is a just God. God is a just God. And someone has to pay the price for sin. In other words, somebody's done something wrong and somebody needs to get a whooping so somebody better fess up. And Jesus, this theory goes, comes to pay the price that he does not owe. He substitutes himself for us and pays the penalty of our sin with his own life. Another way of saying that is that humanity owes a debt it cannot pay, so God pays a debt he does not owe. Now certainly, friends, God anger, God's anger at our sin is justified and righteous. But the problem with this theory is that Jesus says himself, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Where is God's love, God's grace in this theory of atonement? Another option, therapeutic atonement. What this theory tries to address is the fact that sin is a sickness and we are all infected by it. We are all infected by the sickness of sin and we all need a healer. So God sends Jesus to bring the balm that will heal the sickness of our sin. Think about the song, There is a balm in Gilead. There is a balm in Gilead to help the wounded soul. There is a balm in Gilead to, to heal the sin sick soul. And certainly, friends, we can all agree that we are all sickened by sin and that we all need a healer. But the problem is we are not innocent in our suffering. It doesn't address at all the willfulness of our sin and the reality that our will is broken. Final one I want to mention is moral exemplar. And what this theory says is that Jesus came and lived a life of exemplary moral character. And that he suffered and he died unjustly. 
And the theory goes that we, upon seeing the suffering of a righteous, innocent person, will be moved with compassion to imitate his example. And certainly, friends, we should all be imitating Jesus. But the problem with this theory is what's the point of Jesus' sacrifice? What's the point of his blood if he's just a moral example for us to follow? So preacher, which one is it? Which one's right? I don't know. All of them are inherently flawed and all of them carry a bit of the truth. All of them are right to a degree. Because inherent in this whole exercise is that we are human and we are limited. And we are trying in our humanity to explain something that is a divine mystery. Why would God do such a thing? It is baffling that the God of the universe who created all things would give us free will and let us choose to love him, but also to let us choose not to love him, and then would come to deal with that by dying on our behalf. doesn't make any kind of logical human sense at all. Our words, our theories are always going to fall short in trying to figure this out. Charles Wesley writes this in And Can It Be? Tis mystery all. The immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph or angel tries to sound the depth of love divine to try to help us understand that it's about the depth of God's love for us. Tis mercy all. All of it is mercy. Let earth adore, let angel minds inquire no more. In other words, understand that there are just some things you're not going to understand in their fullness this side of heaven. Because the, the important thing here is not which theory is right. What we need to remember is that whatever it is, the, the why is always God's why. It's always God's initiative. It's always God's work for us. Whatever that mysterious design or reason might be, it's always God's grace that makes us right and restores our relationship with God that justifies us, that lines us back up, that tears the curtain in two. The death of Jesus on the cross, the shedding of innocent blood is extreme. Death is a huge price to pay and the truth that Jesus willingly took off his glory and put on human flesh for the sake of dying for our redemption is absolutely good news remember the Philippians Christ him in Christ the fullness of God was pleased to dwell but Jesus let himself be stripped of all those things. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Taking the form of a slave and being born in human flesh and found in human form, he emptied himself. He suffered for us. John Wesley writes it this way. He, Jesus, left his father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race for us. Tis mercy, all of it, immense and free. And this is the part that Charles wants us to hear. And oh my God, it found out me. It's personal. It's not just Jesus died for all humanity, which he did, but us understanding that Jesus died for us particularly is life-changing. Friends, we should never lose sight of the fact that in the justifying grace of God, we are free. Not in the American political sense of that, but freed from the grip of sin that we are powerless to remove. That's what Christian freedom is. Set free from the grip of sin that we are powerless to remove on our own. In the death and resurrection of Jesus, our actual sin and guilt is removed from us. And our hearts are freed from the oppressive power of sin. In other words, not now can we recognize, through provenient grace, we recognize that our will is broken. Our human will and our desire to even do the right thing is broken. And in Christ, in our justification, that broken will is mended. 
And we are set free from the, our captivity to sin. So that means we can choose a different way. Charles Wesley writes this. Long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. In other words, provenient grace. I woke the dungeon of my imprisonment inflamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. Free from the power of sin. Free from the oppression of sin. Free to choose, freely choose, to follow God. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Before justification, friends, we could not will the right or make amends for our sin, but now we are redeemed. And Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no more imprisonment for those who are in Christ Jesus. Or from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the whole world might be saved through him. John 3, 17. There is no condemnation for the redeemed, and that is a gift that demands a response from us to yield ourselves to God's power at work for us making us his calling us his children heirs with God with Christ of eternal life Jesus gives us a share an interest in his blood in his own life in his redemption in his glory and that is the essence of the good news of justifying grace no condemnation, Charles Wesley writes. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him. My living head, in other words, my master. My Lord. And clothed in righteousness divine. Clothed with Christ. The scripture talks about us being clothed in white. Washed in the blood of the lamb. Given new clothes and a new bearing out in the world. Clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Bold, I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Today, friends, we invite you to approach this throne of God boldly. Not because of anything that you have done, but fully and completely reliant on the provenient and the justifying grace of a holy God who removes the guilt of your sin and clothes you and I with righteousness and receive this gift of his body and his blood broken and shed for you and remember the grace that took Jesus to the cross that we might be one with God. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello? Can you hear me now? Is that better? Okay. Can you still hear me? Is it still working? All right. Friends, Christ our Lord invites to this His table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with God and one another. Therefore, let us take a moment to confess our sin before God and each other. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray, and free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, proving his love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen.
I would remind you that our offerings of ourselves and of our financial gifts are always in response to that mercy of God. So whether you're putting your offering in the offering plate or you're offering your heart to God or you're giving online, all of your offering comes from the life of a holy, holy God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets who look for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nations shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, and he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we all feast together at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, we pray together as the Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Friends, you can't see it, but this, all this bread came from one loaf. Reminding us that we who are many are one in Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a cup that is available to all the world. We're going to invite you to come and to receive. You'll receive just the, the cup and um, there's juice in the bottom and bread on the top. And I want to, um, I want to remind you, um, if you're worshiping with us online, that, uh, that we would love the opportunity to bring you communion. So if you will just mention in the comments today or 
um, send a message to us at the church. You can go to our website and just click at the top. It says contact us or get in touch. And, and the message will come directly to us. And we would love the opportunity to bring communion out to you and to break bread with you. I'll invite you to come um, as you feel um, able and led, starting with the praise team. The body of Christ given for you. The body and the blood of Christ broken and shed for you. The body and the blood of Christ broken and shed for you. The body and the blood of Christ broken and shed for you. I'm going to start on this side and go to this side. So come as you um, as you can. Broken and shed for you. The body and the blood of Christ broken and shed for you.
holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.